been involved in policy and guideline development at, at a national level and a provincial level and in several global partnerships. So we have policies and guidelines available for you to see if you want to use in your setting. And we've developed a range of resources. Um, these are online. We've developed films on how to screen and how not to screen. We've developed films on empathic engagement skills. We've developed brochures for fathers, for health workers, um, for women. And um, I can't see. And we've also uh, conducted multimedia advocacy work for a range of audiences, radio, TV, social media. That's all available to share. And we also involved in research. So thank you. Thank you very much, Simone. That was very good to see. Um, okay. And I'm very happy to introduce our last speaker, final speaker on this session before we move into the discussion round. And that is Halik Adam. He's a, a public health specialist with almost 50, four, 15 years of experience in the coordination of nutrition, HIV AIDS, maternal and child health interventions. Halik has several degrees. And um, he's currently the project manager of the Rural Emergency Health Services and Transport for System Development Rest for D project. Um, and he also led the previous project on the Rest for D. Um, Halik, uh, I hope you can unmute yourself and tell us more now. The floor is yours. You're muted currently if you're speaking. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Just uh, just a minute to share my screen. Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, please let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, we can go into presenter slide maybe. Uh, we now that maybe we see your um. Maybe go back to the presentation. I think we see your um, inbox. <laughs> okay, sorry. Can you? Right. Yes, now perfect. Yeah. All right, so that is fine. Yes, so thank you so much. Uh, so, as introduced, my name is Ali Kadam. I work with Public Relief Services Ghana. Um, this presentation is based on the work that has been done in collaboration with uh, Professor. Mimi Lee of George Washington University and Elena Makiwan of CRS headquarters in Kenya and Ghana and Malawi. But uh, the focus of this would be on the with the Ghanaian context. Yes. So the the topic lessons learned in the validation of the integrated mothers and babies course to prevent prenatal depression in sub-Saharan Africa. Actually, this is based on the integrated mothers and babies course, that is uh, the IMBC, which was implemented in Ghana and other parts of the world, including Kenya, Malawi, like I mentioned, and even Tanzania. So the mothers and babies course is a prevention model with the aim of supporting pregnant and lactating mothers to become more resilient to daily stresses by learning coping mechanisms to boost their mood and then prevent depression. So the goal is to reduce the onset of major depressive epitopes by teaching women mood regulation skills integrated with nurturing care. So the, for the mothers and babies course, using the cognitive behavioral therapy and attachment theory, we are able to ensure that uh, money, we are able to keep the IMBC groups, ensuring that uh, mothers are able to identify their own stresses and manage their mood. And so um, as indicated, this is a, if you look at the timeline of the IMBC, this was something that was introduced to CRS by Professor Mimi Lee of George Washington University in 2016. And since then, there have been several adaptations to ensure that it is in line with the local context 
in Tanzania, Kenya, Ghana, Zambia, Malawi, and Rwanda. And so to do this, the aim is to ensure that was to ensure that we are able to get the buy-in of the groups and that uh, we also involve government and local stakeholders to support this initiative. And so from the what was done, we actually had to do an implementation research in Ghana with the support of the university and the result that came out uh, is what informs this presentation based on the, the pilot of this intervention in two districts with the support of the university and in collaboration with the uh, Mimili of George Washington University, our government partners and our headquarters staff were able to identify that with the uh, integrated MBC, there's very high levels of participant satisfaction. Participants were able to use this to regulate their mood and to ensure that uh, they were able to manage their stresses. We also realized that uh, low hope and moderate severe hunger are significantly associated with poor maternal mental health. We realized that most of the mothers who were experiencing high or moderate level of depression also had some there's was well, some similarity between what they experience and then also their level of poverty or their ab ability to uh, be able to manage the, their home and so overall impact we actually realized that there was no difference in maternal depression or child social emotional development between IMBC, ECD, and control groups. We actually had two groups in the pilot area. We had the intervention group and we had the control group. And upon the, the evaluation, we realized that there wasn't much difference in terms of their depression levels for those who undertook the course and those who didn't. But uh, can, upon the sub analysis, please. Yes. So we also realized there was a significant reduction in dispersive symptoms that is associated with higher attendance and also the ability to participate in the group. So in all, the results from the final evaluation indicate that mothers with moderate to severe depression at baseline had less indication. And then uh, also those we, we also realized that they experienced some form of physical and intimate partner violence. And our, among the findings was also that uh, we realized that male involvement was also crucial when it comes to the MBC and model. So basically, those were some of the key findings from the study. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you and stop sharing your screen because we see your email. I think you're multitasking. <laughs> Thank you, Alec. Um, great presentation and good to hear um, from your findings. And I think there's a lot that is similar in what we hear across the whole day, but also from specifically this session. So we're moving now into the conversational part. And may I please ask all panelists uh, to join me on the table here. Uh, the two that I'm person and pick people. Um, so Linos and um, Halik and Yulita, if you could please switch on your cameras. Um, and and uh, is Yulita still there? Uh, uh, do we know if Yulita is still Sorry, I can check. Um, oh yes, Yulita, you're there. Please unmute yourself, uh, Linos as well. Good to have you. And um, so we're moving into the into the Q and A. Um, and I will start off with a question from the um, online participants. So Polanle Enang says, um, "I'm curious about that uh, traditional support." Is Polanle uh, on? Yes, I can see you. Okay. Ah, yeah. Sorry, I accidentally muted you. <laughs> Sorry, can you please unmute yourself? And yeah, please, uh, uh, Bolanle, your question. 
Hi, thank you very much for having uh, my question. I think I'm just very curious about the, um, the traditional setting partnership, especially because in Africa, traditionally, we're supposed to have that um, external family support to sort of mitigate the whole um, maternal depression issue, um, you know, the PNC issue. Um, so I'm curious, as, has there be, been any um, sort of research around that? How has it been? Is it working? Is the traditional system sort of breaking down? Um, and does that also apply not just to teenagers, the adolescents, but to mature women? Those are my questions. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Bolanle. Very good question. Um, I'm not sure if you had asked that question specifically to Linos or if it was a question to the uh, to to the whole panel. But uh, maybe we can just start off with maybe uh, I don't know, Yulita, do you or Linos, do you want to come in and say what your thoughts? If you have any thoughts. Yeah, of course, thoughts will be there. Yeah, you know. Social support, of course, uh, is very important. You know, it was like the preventative aspect, you know, in the African society where, you know, uh, there were matare, you know, people they were sitting down uh, with elders within their families, resolve issues they, they, as they arise. Even if you look at our socialization, we say, Morohi, Magali, you know, all those, uh, the responses, of course, may differ, but in other words, we were they were more interested in in, in addressing mental health issues as they arise. So social support uh, remains very important. However, I hear your question very clearly. You were asking whether there was a research that has been done. Maybe I can leave it to other colleagues now who are the researchers, maybe to respond to that to say, do we have any research? Maybe the desk ones or whatever that has been uh, carried out to make sure that you know social support for sure is very important. But from my own experience, yes, yes, social support was very key for us as African uh, uh, people or community. Back to you, Nicole. Thank you, Linus. Yeah, I think Simon uh, is keen to say something. Okay. Um, I think. Um, I think the traditional structures which were there, which did a lot of the buffering and safeguarding are themselves under enormous strain. And when you have communities under strain of violence and hunger and displacement, um, these factors erode, not only erode individuals, but they under they erode the structures, I see nodding, they erode the structures of, of community cohesion. So those very structures are under threat. And there has been some work that has been shown in South Africa, for instance, that um, the mothers of the index patient or, or of the mothers that we, are, that we are concerned with themselves are often depressed. So we have an intergenerational situation of depression um, in the home or anxiety in the home I've reviewed work and recently in Rwanda, the, 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 the trauma, this transgenerational um, uh, impact of trauma on societies. So, <clears throat> and these things really do impact um, uh, and, and, and pull apart these, these cultural buffering mm. factors. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions, so I'm gonna move on. Um, so we have, do we have questions in the room? Yes, we do. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna, Fix the. Uh... Okay, thank you. Thank you, all the presenters. My name is David. Uh, so I'm the regional CDR fellow at National Department of Medicine. So my question is for all of you. I'm not uh, from mental health. Uh, area. So I, I work in infectious disease, but I'm interested in um, mental health and maternal mental health. Uh, so, yeah, so all of the presentations are from Africa, but I have seen so many presentations, so many things, but I haven't seen any study which has been conducted 
in Africa where is where, where what is going on because um, this is prenatal mental health in the woman who lives in the war zones are uh, and in the woman who live in peaceful areas are totally different. Most of these studies have been conducted in peaceful areas. What about the mothers who live in those areas? So do, do you have any plan to conduct in like such kind of studies? And do you think those, uh, for example, the tools that you have tested in your research are like feasible on, on those areas? So yeah, this is my question. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, so the question um, for anyone online who didn't hear it is sort of the difference between um, maternal mental health in peaceful settings and normal settings, and then the added challenge when we look at conflict settings and how that affects perinatal mental health. And we did hear earlier a little bit from Josephine Akelot on the sort of conflict affected populations um, setting and how they dealt with it in um, Uganda. But I don't know if Josephine is still here or if maybe someone, I don't know who could be a good person. Maybe Wendy looks like she might. Well, I, so I haven't done any research. I think this is a really good and important question. And I'm sure the challenges will be even larger. Maybe Josephine can get to that. But um, I think in addition, one thing that I have been thinking about a lot is that apart from the existing conflict situations, we are going into an era of climate change that is going to mm -hmm. you know, affect everybody's right all over the world, but especially vulnerable populations tremendously as well. And I think so thinking about women and women's health and women's mental health in all these very um, precarious settings, mm -hmm. I think it's of the utmost importance indeed because it's going to increase tremendously. So I thank you for that question. Um, but I haven't done anything on it yet. I'm just thinking about it. But... Thank you. OK, I'm going to move on to the next question online from Debjit Sen. Uh, Debjit, are you able to unmute? Do you want to ask your question? Because you had a question for Wendy. Sure. Um, thank you uh, for the opportunity to ask a question. So I guess uh, this is more of blue sky thinking around the intervention. So um, there are some studies which show that um, when you facilitate bonding with the unborn child or with your child, both born and unborn, um, it does help alleviate um symptoms um, of depression. So I was wondering if, uh, you know, thinking of more of like, you know, building off of what you already have done, and I'm assuming these are in the health facility waiting areas, when these women are waiting to receive antenatal care, um, and then you have a service provider engaging them in these group sessions, have you considered integrating content around how they can bond with their unborn child and continue bonding and being a responsive caregiver once a child is born? And also some counseling on managing interpersonal relationships at home with a male partner, with their in-laws, um, and um, seeing ways in which they can receive care um for uh you know various <laughs> jobs at home that women unfortunately are often tasked with doing with little support and the second question is similar to a question i'd asked a previous presenter um, who was presenting data from madagascar so i think i saw that you said that the prevalence of poor mental health was roughly 40 percent and um, i was wondering um what tool you're using and if you were uh, if you had sort of purposively selected groups of women who had um, certain vulnerabilities because the number does seem to be a little high um, based on my experiences working in Western Kenya. Thanks and over. Yeah, thank you. So so the 40% the was based on the PHQ-2, right? So that was a screening tool. But when the women that came in, that were invited and that came to the session about um, one month later, I think 70% or so of them still scored high on the PHQ-9 and the EPBS at that time. So it was a low-income group of women because they were enrolled in that one care program that was um, targeting these vulnerable populations that might have contributed to it. Um, uh, yeah, but what? But to be to be clear about that, it was not like a, a full-fledged uh, depression, depression skill. Um, as for your first question, so, um, one of the uh, things that came out of the endline. Sorry, service... can you speak up a bit? We yeah. have some issues. Sorry, I don't know. I think this is picking up. Is it, or would we interfere with if we put a microphone here? 
Maybe if you can speak up a bit. Sorry, Wendy, if they can't hear so well. Yeah, so for your, as for your first question, um, one of the uh, suggestions that came up based on the endline focus group discussions that we did afterwards with, with the women and their partners and the nurses and so on, was in fact to integrate more um, these types of topics. So they didn't really talk about bonding issues, but really to how as a mother you can take care of yourself and your baby during pregnancy and after birth. So this would especially be one of the things that could be then integrated in such a program because that's what that lacked actually. So that there was only emphasis on mental health support, but but the but the more literal like uh, the physical connection and physical health that that was lacking from the curriculum as well. Thank you, Wendy. Um, and. We, uh, I think we had some more questions in the room. That I saw some more hands. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. It's quite a practical question, actually. Can you mention the, um, the tool that you used to measure wasn't, you had to develop a different tool because it wasn't appropriate. Do you know, do any of you know if there's a kind of um, overall summary that anybody has done of all the different ways that the different tools have been validated in different ways in different countries and maybe that could just go on some one of the notes or something rather than taking too much time and I know Wendy and I were talking in the break but that also could, could apply to measures of empowerment as well I'd just be really interested rather than going and doing that whole piece of work actually somebody's probably already done a kind of you know, collation of different tools and different ways that they're validated in different settings. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a very good point. Um, and uh, I think also, Simone, you have an answer. Yeah, I'm very involved in the screening issue. Um, we have, in fact, developed exactly that for the WHO guide that came out in 2022, but in, it didn't make the final publication but it should be coming out in the toolkit that's going to be coming um, uh, soon. Um, we, um, I think, though, that the bottom line is that a lot of these tools are developed sometimes quite um, randomly in high-income settings using local idioms of distress that are suitable for Edinburgh or the US. And people in the African setting should not shy away yeah. from <laughs> developing tools and there are a few tools as an example of the Shona symptom questionnaire from Zimbabwe. And in Kenya, there's a tool that was developed combining local idioms of distress with, with psychiatric conditions. I think we need to be developing our own tools. And, um, you know, or to really interrogate these tools from elsewhere and really test them, field test them to find out are they suitable for women on the ground. Thank you. Um... I don't know if uh, Yulita, uh, do you maybe uh, have a comment on that also? And maybe we can also lead into sort of the next question that we had from Valentina, who talks about, um, I don't know if Valentina is still, oh yeah, you're on there. Valentina, do you want to come in with your question? Sure, thank you so much. And hi, everyone. Oh, sorry, I can hear a bit of an echo. So I just wanted to find out, we are looking at a community-based or a community organization-led intervention within Limpopo in South Africa. And that's specifically looking at using community-based organizations to provide soft touch intervention for those with, um, you know, mild symptoms of uh, prenatal and or postnatal depression. And I just want to find out the thoughts on in a situation of scaling these kinds of interventions, if using community-led organizations is advisable due to the variability across different re regions, because they're quite specific, you know, in each of the areas that you work in. Thanks. Thanks, Valentina. Um, maybe uh, one of our online um, panelists, I don't know, Yulita, uh, do, you, do you have maybe, from your own work, do you have anything to, to respond to this? Yeah, so uh, the formative study did not have a, a specific intervention, but we were trying to find out if integrating uh, screening for CPMDs would help. So it was about the screening, not a particular um, implementation strategy. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, and uh, Halik, 
Is it, would it be something that, are you still, yeah, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Yes, so, so I think uh, with uh, the community base, the screening was usually supported with the, we have with Ghana, Ghana Health Services, we have uh, mental health offices in the district, district offices. So it was easy to be able to work through district offices to have officers screen at the point of care and then refer to the next level. So I think uh, this uh, supported and we also had outreach and home visits which supported the uh, screening at the community level and then also referral was done to the district level. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Heli. Um, Linos, do you have any other thoughts on the sort of scaling question and that we just heard from Valentina in terms of sustainability and <clears throat> yeah, community lead? Yeah, of course, you know, at community, that's, that's everything is happening, early identification. So uh, I think it's very important to prioritize community first, you know, then of course, uh, a referral necessary, but it still goes back to the communities where the families are. Because of course, if you maybe the, uh, it's, a, it's a severe condition, not mild, Maybe somebody goes to the psychiatric center. It needs also to go back to the community. So what it means is the community remains, you know, very, very, very important uh, in this equation. So I think that would be a very good, uh, very good uh, idea or intervention. So even now, most of the donors they just want to put money direct to the community where things are happening. So it's 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 it's, it's a very good approach uh, towards uh, addressing common perinatal mental health. That's my submissions. Over to you, Nico. Okay, thank you very much, Linos. Okay, I think, uh, okay, there's one hand, um, Estelle, one very quick one, and then we're slowly or quickly going to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you for this. As the expert, I think, um, Simone, I think I, I, I discussed with, the, with you uh, a bit. This is 20 years of experience, 20 years of work, what you've tested, you know, models at work and all that. So my question to you as an expert, how can we make mental health visible within maternal child health in Africa? Because it's still not visible. We're talking about evidence and all that, but it's it's very small percentage of research that has been done. We talked about East Africa a lot here, Francophone West Africa. It has nothing been done there. How can we make it visible? And my question for you is, should we waste our resources at time to test those guidelines? Or should we say we have an example already within the continent and we use it and we scale? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's what dinner's for. <laughs> and I wish everybody could join. But visibility is important. Um, but I think we need to think about who we who we want it to be visible for. And we need to tailor our messaging for different audiences. So visibility for a policymaker might be visibility different from visibility from a husband and everybody in between. Um, I think we need to get smarter in terms of translating evidence from the science, the realm of science lingo into something that's that the non-scientists can understand. And I think we need to you, we, we need to attack the visibility problem from several angles. So we need to have um, radio personalities and influencers and people with lived experiences who are willing to share their stories and scientists and, and health workers who, who really have dirt under their fingernails to come and speak forward and, and lots of different modalities. It's not, there's no one solution. And then your second question was on? Uh, exemplar. Yeah, exemplar. I think I think there is I think it's a balance because we have exemplars, we have the WHO guide now, we have other people's guides, but we need to be careful that we don't just swallow what's given because we need to check, and it doesn't have to be very extensive. We need to check that this tool, this guideline is appropriate for my setting because if it isn't, it can actually do harm. 
So we need to do some field testing um, and, and feel bold enough to say, hold on, we're going to take this, but we're going to change that and we're going to throw out this because we're the local experts. Okay, I think that's maybe a great word to end, a great note to end on here. Sorry, I would love to keep talking, but we've already run five minutes off over and people need to log off. The time in Africa, of course, is a bit ahead of us. So people are really tired and had a long day and there were great contributions. Um, okay, thank you very much to the panel.